So next up, we've got Jess Reed. Uh, Jess is Principal Transport Engineer from Vitamin and Boss uh, UK Limited. Um, she's actually going to be presenting a case study about turning polluted and congested kind of urban areas into healthy high streets. Um, we had a good chat before uh, today, and it sounds really interesting. So uh, please welcome Jess. to be here with you all in possibly the most comfortable chairs I've ever experienced in a place. Um, picking up from Guy's presentation, it's so interesting what he said at the end. Um, we've never walked less since we've record, started recording data, um, which we can go back to about 1912, and we've got good data from the 70s. We've never walked less than we do today. And within that same lifespan, let's say within our common lifespan, the number of cars on the road has quadrupled. So when you look out on your street at home, there are literally four times more cars um, than when we were all younger. Um, and it, all, each one of those cars had, it drives more and more miles. So we've been very successful at doing that. And I'd like to unpick in this project uh, some examples of why we've been so successful at promoting car travel and why people are walking so little. So this project was born with Cycling UK and ourselves uh, we thought back to things that we've learned over the past uh, few years, and we came up with this idea of doing an inspiration study, which is just this little opportunity to actually step back and take a breath and, and start to imagine a, a best-case scenario. This builds on a very special walking project. You know, one of the most remarkable things is, even on a bad day, walking still makes up 20% of transport. Walking is the single most powerful medicine we have on our market, yet we have no dedicated transport budgets for walking and also no dedicated staff. So I don't think it's that surprising that walking is declining. So this link, uh, it's a free lunch. It's a really excellent technical report uh, which you're welcome to, to use. So when we put this into a context like Portsmouth, Portsmouth is a terrific city. It's got this kind of beachy area, promenade. It's got the harbours with this kind of interesting naval background and the view across to, to yachts and things. It's, it's growing with students and their population growth completely outstripped any predictions, but they're completely, completely challenged by air pollution and congestion. And when we look at this in specific public health terms, uh, this is really quite shocking. shocking. So 36% of children in Portsmouth have metabolic disease. So the problem isn't that kids are overweight or fat. The problem is, is that a, a 10 or 11 year old child has the metabolism of a middle-aged adult. And children don't know yet that, that metabolisms are going to crash in their mid-30s, so they've got nowhere to decline from. And it's very similar for child lung development. If your child doesn't develop their lungs, they've got nowhere to decline from later in life. So if we look at the air pollution levels in uh, Portsmouth for particulate matter, that is equivalent to over 550 cigarettes per baby and child. Everyone is smoking that. And I think that's deeply, deeply shocking. So a little caveat, that, that calculation is not perfect, and I would like to proof it more intensely. But um, I think actually reporting particulate matter in cigarettes is a very powerful way to explain to people the level of risk. So my question to you is, which type of air pollution causes more death? Illegal levels of NO2s, which we're hearing a lot about in the news, or legal levels of particulate matter? And do I press or does it come automatically? Okay, it's magic. The answer, the audience choice is... Here we go. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I wasn't practicing <laughs> Well, I must say, you are a very informed audience. Uh, you are quite right. Of the 40,000 estimated annual deaths in the UK due to air pollution, over two-thirds are attributable to legal levels of particulate matter. Uh, particulate matter, the origin of it, is from the vehicle, it's from the brakes, the tyres, the right hand of the road. And you know, if we don't inhale it, it then goes into our water systems, and it's really a, a bad news story. So I don't think a lot of people in the general public understand that. I think our current situation is very, very confusing. So if we look at Portsmouth and we use the potential for walking and cycling, this is a very simple tool. 
Um, what we can see is that actually all of the city centres with an, a one easy 20 minute mile walk uh, reachable, the entire island of Portsmouth, Portsea Island, actually lies within a 15 minute cycling radius and if we future proof for e-cycles, actually this is, this is really interesting. You know what, Portsmouth could go car free. I mean, there would be no problem. Let's just switch off the engines, they would be totally fine. So what we looked at is one of the, the four kind of main <coughs> corridors and we looked at what is really one of the most congested, busiest high street corridors. It's also kind of charming. It's got this beautiful Art Deco architecture. It's very close to the city centre. It's surrounded by some of the most deprived areas. Um, but congestion, traffic safety are, are very, very real. So again, if we look at the data, um, Portsmouth is very, very car reliant. And Guy, you had the same statistic that the majority of these car journeys are actually short journeys. So there's real potential to switch over to healthy transport modes. And if we look at cities with similar reference uh, populations, Freiburg, for example, uh, is achieving, and sorry, if I add together walking, cycling, and public transport, because in fact it's not about being dogmatic about cycling, it's about giving people transport options and choices, and Freiburg has achieved an incredibly impressive, basically 80% healthy transport. So we can see that people have got real options. Now, one of the things I find so interesting, I've had the privilege of working in Freiburg, is the real difference between them and us is that their city gets a direct revenue income per inhabitant. So their business model as a city is much more direct. Um, and I think the thing I worry most about in the UK is not fake news, it's actually fake business, fake economy, because a lot of the tools that the DFT uses to calculate the value of a transport scheme take no account of the direct costs to health, social cohesion uh, of these transport choices. And at the same time, we're bleeding out through the NHS with these unaffordable costs and having poor quality of life. So we set Portsmouth a challenge, which is 1% modal shift per mode per year. This is a total fantasy, um, because what we know is that some cities have achieved this, this modal shift in one area, um, but very few have achieved it across <coughs> modes, and we also know there are lots of cities who have failed to do this. So when I spoke to the transport engineers in Portsmouth City Council, who are really collaborative and interested, in, and um, they commissioned a new transport survey this August, and they provided me with the data, and the first thing I can see is in their brand new survey, they haven't counted people. So they've just counted vehicles. So they give me a number, there are 12,000 vehicles on this road, but where are the people cycling? Where are the people walking? Where are the people using the bus? So this is a fundamental structural issue in the UK. We use transport models. We make incredibly important decisions using transport models, which actually don't include people in them. There'll be no walking and there'll be no cycling. So. I think that's a really important difference because you can see if we add the people, which we can do in a robust way, actually there are 22,000 people on the street and that's already starting to change how we make our decisions. So this is the London Road as it stands. I think this is probably be quite familiar to all of us. It's this <coughs> high street which is struggling to survive. It's got these lovely little bits of heritage architecture. It's completely congested. We can see from the traffic surveys that cars zoom along at 30 or 40 miles per hour then they get to the lights and wait for two minutes, then they zoom along again for another stretch, and there was a pedestrian death this summer. Uh, it's just simply not a safe or enjoyable place to spend time. So the kind of transformation we're looking at is actually moving away from using 1970s motorway design standards, which is the current design standard for these roads, to a kind of a, a place, a city, a boulevard concept. And there are simple things like, so, what they've already started, we're taking their three lanes currently, we take one of those lanes and turn it into an asset zone. So this is where you can place your rubbish bins and your trees and your cycle parkings and your bench, as we mentioned earlier, which are so essential for people to be able to get out and about. We can create space for cafes to put seating out and to start having that life. We're using a material wayfinding. There's, there's no good reason why all of our roads should be black. We can add colours to make them more attractive and more sensitive. And doing things like taking out the white line in the middle, because by visually narrowing the road, we make this look like what it is, what it should be, which is a low speed, high capacity network. And little details like treating the secondary junctions, this is where most pedestrians and cyclists are killed and hurt. It's also where most motor users, motorcyclists and vehicle users have their accidents, uh, making that a standard along. So I'm just gonna zoom through to show you some of the things. So, the thing is, we're turning this into this kind of healthy high street, but where is all the movement? Um, and clearly this is not the ideal place for a child to cycle. 
So what we're proposing in this instance is a parallel cycle street, which is a very interesting Dutch infrastructure type and which unlocks all sorts of things. It connects to all these schools which occur on this network. There's also a supermarket, a pub, and we're in very close proximity to this road um, to actually be able to then cycle to the high street and, and park and access it. I think the cycle street is a Dutch innovation which could have potential to completely transform our UK net road network and actually make safe cycling a viable choice for everybody. So I really want to underline that the data shows us that cycling isn't safe in the UK. So when people say they don't cycle because they're not confident, actually what they're doing is making a very intelligent health decision because it's not safe. The only thing worse is driving because the long-term health implications of driving are so incredibly poor. So features of the cycle street are explicit wayfinding messaging. The red carpet in the Netherlands indicates it's a cycle lane, it's cycle priority, everybody knows that. Treatment of the secondary junctions. So this is both relates to physical infrastructure, the footway is continuous, but there's also legal infrastructure which backs it up, uh, which everybody knows there's an implied liability. If a car hits a cyclist or a pedestrian, there is an implied li liability to the car driver. There's also the social infrastructure, which is, I really, I have to say, frankly, I am sceptical about teaching children to cycle when we're not teaching drivers to drive safely for cyclists and children. So my colleagues in the Netherlands, when they come over, they're shocked that cycle safety isn't a mandatory uh, part of driver training, getting your driving licence. So this is what happens on a cycle street. One minute there are two kids cycling next to each other having a chat. The next minute there's somebody with a mobility device or somebody on a skateboard. Um, it just completely frees up the network. And what's fantastic about this is you can still park in front of the shop, in front of your house. We're not challenging that access, but what we're saying is that cyclists have a legal right of way. You can't overtake a cyclist. Uh, and of course, the speed limit is, 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 is reduced. You have a liability to reduce your speed to keep other people safe. Now, this is a transport model. I'm going to very, very arrogantly say this is the most sophisticated transport model in the country. It's GCSE level maths, uh, done in an Excel spreadsheet. But the thing that we've done, which 99% of other transport uh, engineers aren't doing, is we've included the walking and cycling in this model. So I, I won't go into the detail, but in three models, we can explore uh, models of displacement and modal shift. And we can see in the ultimate healthy max, healthy high street, we actually don't have any displacement. We, we're able to accommodate a full mo modal shift to walking and cycling. So I want to end on, um, come towards what I think are the most important infrastructure innovations. So this is something so simple. So my joke is I grew up in the gut of Camden High Street because uh, the footway was so narrow, you constantly had to step into the road and kind of fight it out with buses and taxis. And I'm so proud to have been part of this to introduce a level loading bays. Loading bays are empty 97% of the time. Um, we have restricted loading times where shops can come. And also, if a shop owner needs to whip in and unload, they can still do it. But you're doubling the capacity of your walking lane. And those numbers are really, really impressive. And this is really, I think, the single most important infrastructure innovation we need in our road environment. Children in Denmark and the Netherlands are 15 to 19 times safer per mile cycled. And this has to do with the treatment of secondary junctions. Um, it's wonderful for pedestrians. The footway is continuous. Uh, it's supported by a legal right of way for pedestrians and cyclists. And the reason it's so important is because a second later, the cyclists go past. And um, I, think, I think this is so simple and it would be such an easy win. And you know, if we put in one of these for every child in the country, I think we would be really moving towards a bright future. And this is just an example of why this van was completely perplexed, why I didn't walk across or cycle across the road, because the messaging is so explicit. It's the combination of the physical infrastructure, these sharp teeth imply a legal right of way, the use of a red material to indicate a cycle footway, and of course that driver, as every other driver in the Netherlands, has had that instruction as part of the licensing that pedestrians and cyclists have right of way. So continuous level of footways, and I think we need a more peppy name, but they're being introduced across the country. This is a really nice example from Waltham Forest. What I really like are the supportive road markings. I think we definitely need, need this in the UK. And in fact, this is interesting because this is a really cheapo 
a backup plan, which is just to do this with road markings, um, just to get started. So my suggestion is we use double giveaway markings. Uh, using stop markings would also be a really good solution. And the really cool thing about this is actually it could be delivered through existing maintenance budgets, micro-asphalting, and basically for a few pennies in every case, a little bit of mental and emotional uh, work to adopt a new practice. And actually we could easily deliver this across UK cities in the next 10 years for free, essentially. So I think I would um, leave you there. These are the types of innovations I think we need to um, make places like Portsmouth into genuinely healthy high streets. Thank you very much. Thank you.